It's no secret that AG1 and all these other greens powders have a ton of problems with them. One, half of it is a proprietary blend. You have no real idea what you're getting. Two, even if you do know what you're getting, the ingredients they tell you you're getting are often trash, the doses are often trash, and all of this at a super expensive price point. However, now there is a new competitor, I am eight, with David Beckham, who claims to have solved all of these problems. So in this video, we're breaking down I am eight versus AG1, breaking down greens powders and what's actually included in them, should you be taking the ingredients that are in them and at what actual doses are valuable. So first, let's go over every single difference between IM8 and AG1 and really see if IM8 has cured the green powder problem. First is vitamin D. AG1 does not include vitamin D and that's a huge miss in my opinion. Vitamin D is one of the most important vitamins you're probably taking. You're most commonly gonna be deficient in vitamin D compared to any other vitamin or mineral. So why not include it in this greens powder? Well, I am eight actually does include it, which is awesome. They include 35 micrograms or essentially 1200 IUs. Now, is that an optimal dose though? Well, 1200 IUs is definitely gonna get you out of the deficient zone, essentially less than 20 nanograms per deciliter. But deficient and optimal are two different things. Optimal vitamin D is gonna be more like 40 to 60 nanograms per deciliter. And to get to this point, Studies have shown that you really need closer to two to 3,000 IUs per day. So good start by IM8, but still not hitting it on the vitamin D optimal levels. Next up is vitamin K2, which is super important for calcium regulation. Essentially, if you supplement with vitamin K2, it's theorized that you will decrease your calcium deposition within blood vessels, causing that atherosclerosis or hard plaque. And instead, you will allow the calcium to maintain in bone, which will strengthen your bone formation. However, are we getting the correct dose within these supplements? Well, AG1 doesn't even tell us the dose. So as far as I'm concerned, it might as well be zero. And for IM8, they included 40 micrograms. Now let's look at the studies and see if that's a good dose. Well, for the calcium deposition in blood vessels and inhibiting that effect, studies have shown that 90 micrograms and up is really where you wanna be. And even then, the studies have shown that if you don't already have some calcium in your blood vessels, this likely isn't a supplement that you need. And what about for bone density and maintaining calcium deposition in bone? Again, similar story. 90 micrograms and up is generally the study dose at which we could possibly see an effect. However, if you don't already have a bunch of calcified plaque buildup, likely not a supplement that you need. Next up is CoQ10 or ubiquinol. CoQ10 is used in our electron transport chain within our mitochondria to produce ATP or energy for our cells and then for our body. It's also a great antioxidant. So you can imagine it has a bunch of potential use cases for supplementation. However, are we getting the right dose in IM8 or AG1? Again, AG1, an unknown dose of CoQ10, so it's negligible in my opinion. For IM8 though, we have 100 milligrams. Is that enough for certain indications of CoQ10 supplementation? Well, for high blood pressure, some people have noted that CoQ10 can cause a positive effect. One study specifically showed about a five point decrease in systolic blood pressure due to CoQ10 supplementation with 100 to 200 milligrams per day. So right about there for IM8 at that low end at 100 milligrams. Another study demonstrated that CoQ10 can also help with fatigue, which again makes sense based on its use in the electron transport chain. However, they also showed a dose dependent effect in this study with higher doses causing a higher effect on fatigue and specifically 300 to 500 milligrams per day giving us a greater anti-fatigue effect. Another study demonstrated that CoQ10 was beneficial for erectile dysfunction at 200 milligrams per day. And yet another study demonstrated that CoQ10 was great for migraine prevention, but most doses were upwards of 400 milligrams per day instead of just 100 milligrams. And finally, looking at CoQ10 for overall cardiovascular disease prevention, which is honestly one of the most important reasons to take CoQ10, a study demonstrated that it was great at reducing reactive oxygen species, great at improving nitrate oxide production, and a lot of other mechanistic effects that improve cardiovascular disease risk, however, at 200 milligrams per day. So basically, I take all this data to mean that CoQ10 at 100 milligrams per day might have actually some beneficial effect. However, if you could just up it to two to 300 milligrams per day, you're likely gonna get actually a lot of benefit from CoQ10. So I wish they really just would have included two to three times what they included for CoQ10. Next up on our differences between AG1 and IM8 is MSM or methyl sulfonylmethane. MSM is a great antioxidant and anti-inflammatory specifically for joint health, decreasing soreness and improving skin health or decreasing wrinkles, etc. However, are we getting enough? AG1 has none of this in it. 
But IM8 says they give you a high dose of one gram. Is one gram actually a high dose though? Well, it depends on the indication. For joint health, most of the studies that I found were all two grams if you actually wanted to see a positive effect on decreasing joint pain, et cetera. What about for decreasing muscle soreness? Well, again, most of the studies that I found were at least three grams per day in order to see a decreased fatigue and decreased muscle soreness after exercise from MSM. And finally, what about skin, anti-aging, decreasing wrinkles, etc.? Well, here you actually might see a positive effect with only one gram. However, studies did note that increasing up to three grams would improve your benefit on skin health. So overall, I think MSM is a great supplement, but this is not a high dose. Three grams would have been much more beneficial to include for IMA. Now, what about for prebiotic fiber? This is obviously a very important one for AG1 and IM8 and any greens powder as they really focus on giving you a nutritional supplement. And IM8 says that they include three milligrams of prebiotic fiber compared to the two milligrams that AG1 provides. Well, prebiotic fiber is essentially fiber that can be broken down by your gut microbiome in order to flourish that microbiome and grow it. It's basically food for the good bacteria in your gut. However, is three milligrams or two milligrams enough? Well, not really. If you only give 2.5 grams of prebiotic fiber, you're really not gonna see any increase in the good bacteria in your gut. However, if you give up to 10 grams, then you start to see a blooming of that good bacteria species. So two versus three, sure, three is better, but you need more, you need a lot more fiber. And in total, you need 40 grams of fiber optimally per day. So this is not gonna be a good replacement for a fiber source. And you really need a lot more than what's being included in these green packs. Next up on the differences is vitamin C. AG1 has 420 milligrams, whereas IM8 has 900 milligrams. Is this a beneficial increase? Well, honestly, the jury is out on vitamin C dosing. Some studies say you need up to a gram. Some studies say you only need 200 milligrams. So it really depends on your specific situation. If you are someone who is in need of an acute increase in your antioxidants and in your anti-inflammatories, vitamin C is gonna be good to increase your dose up to a gram. However, if you're not someone who is needing extra antioxidant or anti-inflammatory support, you likely don't need high doses of vitamin C. Next up is riboflavin or vitamin B2 a great supplement for maintaining good energy levels and for skin and hair health. However, do you actually need a lot of it to get these effects? Well, the recommended daily intake is 1.1 to 1.3 milligrams. And in AG1, you get two milligrams, so above that. And you get even more now in IM8, about 4.2 milligrams. So is it more beneficial to have more? Well, there's a lot of studies that use 10, 50, 100 milligrams of B2. I never see a study that they only use four. So the difference between two and four is probably negligible, truthfully. And if you actually wanna see a different effect, like some in the studies that are mentioned for specifically improving aspects of your gut health, then you're gonna need much higher than what you're getting in these supplements. However, I'm glad that both of the supplements include recommended daily allowances of these because it is an important supplement to make sure you're getting enough. Of. Next then is magnesium. And this is kind of a laughable difference really because IM8 is now including 65 milligrams of magnesium compared to the 26 milligrams of AG1. And why this is laughable is because in order to have optimal magnesium levels or what I like to define as a red blood cell magnesium of about 5.8, you need way more than 65 milligrams of magnesium. You're gonna need much closer to three, four, 500 milligrams of magnesium. So upping from 26 to 65 is really not making a difference and you definitely need to supplement with magnesium elsewhere. Then the rest of the differences between the vitamins and minerals of listed doses really are pretty negligible. AG1 has more vitamin E, compared to IM8, which has more vitamin C. So I think those kind of balance out truthfully in regards to both having antioxidant potential and the rest of the vitamins and minerals are pretty much the same. Another key difference between IM8 and AG1 is the probiotic that's included. IM8 contains spore probiotics or bacillus species, while AG1 includes bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. Bifidobacteria and lactobacillus are generally much more studied and they do have positive effects. So it's good on AG1 for including those. They have great positive effects in treating IBS symptoms and in just maintaining good gut microbiome status. However, the spore probiotics are more up and coming, this bacillus species, due to their ability to survive the harsh environment of stomach acid production and digestive enzymes. And essentially they're more likely to make it to your large intestine or your colon 
where they actually need to colonize. That's kind of a plus for the spore probiotics. And I typically reach for these ones when I'm treating a patient with IBS symptoms or with pretty bad gut symptoms versus I'll typically reach for the lactobacillus or the bifidobacteria when a patient is just looking to maintain their overall health and maintain a general healthy gut microbiome. And this is largely due to the fact that there are many studies coming out that spore probiotics are great for patients with IBS. And finally, what about clinical trials? Are either of these powders actually studied against placebo in a trial? So AG1 was studied against a placebo and the really the only difference they were able to find is that it did in fact colonize the gut with the probiotic strain that they gave it. Other than that, it, it didn't change stool frequency or gut symptoms, etc. It didn't really change anything else, but they didn't measure too much else other than gut symptoms. On the other hand, IM8 is currently underway in a study against placebo in which they're going to measure energy levels, micronutrient levels, skin and hair health, and many other dependent variables. So I think it'll be really interesting to follow up on this to see if IM8 actually has clinically proven efficacy where AG1 has not yet had a placebo-controlled study proving its efficacy in anything other than improving your gut microbiome. So what is the final verdict? IM8 versus AG1, has IM8 actually solved all green powder problems? Well, I think definitely not. As you can hear from the previous discussion, essentially the doses are just still not optimal and they have a lot of great ingredients, but the doses are just not there. However, do I think IM8 is actually better than AG1? I really do. I think the inclusion of CoQ10 at 100 milligrams is really good. You might not be getting the best benefit of 300 milligrams, but you're still getting something. Same thing with vitamin D. I like the probiotic better, truthfully. So I think there's a lot of things going for it compared to AG1. However, I still think it's a marginal difference. And I think both of them still have a lot of problems. So on that point, should you take either of them though? Or in what I'm telling you, should you take IM8? And I think the answer is still probably not for many reasons. One, you still need a lot more fiber from a whole foods diet than what this powder can give you. Three grams is still nowhere near the 40 grams that you're gonna need per day. So you still need a whole food diet. Secondarily, while you can still get a lot of good nutrients from these superfoods, it's more likely that you're gonna get more from a whole food diet. They're gonna be much more bioavailable if you get them from the whole food compared to getting them from a ground up powder such as IM8 or AG1. Also, a whole food, specifically Mediterranean diet, has been proven time and time again and study after study to have a billion health effects, including cardiovascular health, brain health, etc. So in my opinion, why would we not just do a Mediterranean whole food diet, which we know scientifically speaking is going to improve all health markers compared to a powder, which we have no evidence to as of yet, that's actually going to improve long-term health outcomes. However, say you are gonna do this Mediterranean whole food diet, but you feel like you actually might get some extra help from an AG1 or an IM8. Is there still a place for it in that case? I still don't think so because I would much rather spend $100 a month on individualized supplementation that you actually need. For instance, do you actually need vitamin K2? Well, if you don't have known calcified arteries in your heart, then you likely are not gonna benefit that much from vitamin K2, and I would save and spend that money elsewhere. Specifically, maybe on an omega-3. Watch the video on this channel as to why I think it's the best supplement out there and most studied, and it's not included in either of IM8 or AG1. And still, there's even more problems to talk about, some that we've already mentioned. One is the dosing is still not optimal. Pretty much on everything we just talked about, they needed to include more. And that's the case on AG1 and IM8. And then finally, these proprietary blends. You really just don't know what's in them. They have a lot of great ingredients, but I can guarantee you that they're not at efficacious doses. Look at, for instance, the cell rejuvenation technology on IM8. It's 25 milligrams total, and it contains berberine and resveratrol. Both berberine and resveratrol need 500 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams to actually provide an effect. So and it only contains 25 milligrams total of those plus other ingredients. So you aren't getting anywhere near an efficacious effect from the berberine or resveratrol included in that proprietary blend. Or look at the adaptogen complex. It's only 200 milligrams total, and rhodiola, for instance, is listed in the middle of the ingredients. Rhodiola, a great adaptogen, but you need close to 300 to 500 milligrams per day to actually provide an effect. So if it's only 200 milligrams total and you need 300 milligrams at least of an ingredient that's not even the most abundant in that proprietary blend, 
you're just not going to get anywhere near an efficacious dose. And finally, same with the essential amino acid proprietary blend, alpha lipoic acid, glutamine, boron. We reviewed all of those on this channel and all of them need way higher doses than what is even the total dose of that proprietary blend. So I would really be cautious in thinking you're actually going to get any benefit from these proprietary blends of these powders and these one size fits all supplements. So in sum, I say, don't take IM8, don't take AG1. However, I do think IM8 does have a small leg up on AG1. Just stick away from both of them and get the supplements you actually need and eat a whole food Mediterranean diet. Thanks so much for watching. If this video helped you at all, please hit that subscribe button for more videos weekly on supplements, lifestyle, longevity, weight loss, performance, or any other video that you want me to talk about, drop it in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for the support and watching the video, and I will see you again next time.